Let's continue. It's the last talk of the program. So Theo Johnson Fried will tell us about PMF and SQFT questions and conjectures. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And as just said, this is the last talk. So I think before everybody kind of drifts off into their checking their emails, um, we should all thank um, Kumran and Du and Francesco and Pavel for putting together such a wonderful workshop. Oh, uh, we should also thank uh, IT, ICDP IT support and administrative support yes. for find the scene. Yeah, these these workshops you. don't don't happen without a lot of support from from the technology side. Um, so the other thing is that since I'm the last speaker, I'm going to do something that I only get to do, I think, is when I'm the last speaker, which is I'm not going to tell you anything I actually understand or know. My talk's going to be mostly about things I don't understand and questions that I that maybe you know the answer to, but I don't. So, um, right. So that's what I'm. That's that's the point. I'm going to talk about questions and conjectures. Um, so, but I will sort of remind a little bit about what TMF is and how it's supposed to be related to quantum field theory. Um, and if you want to read the slides at some other pace, you can download them. So um, Dan already talked a lot about um, TMF and quantum field theory and the Siegel and schultz teichner proposal. So let me, I won't say, I won't go into too much detail. Topological modular forms are an object of derived algebraic geometry and derived number theory, at least in the way they've been defined so far by, by Hopkins and Miller and Gorse and Learn. I probably should have put Haynes' name on the list. Well, anyway, there's lots of other people who've worked on it. Um, and to really work with topological modular forms is to work with modular forms. They're objects, as I said, they're objects of number theory and, and, and algebraic geometry, more homotopized. So the machinery that you need to do to work with them um, at a, is to do things like tracking actions by Galois groups and tracking descent data um, for, and, and really handling um, you know, spectral schemes over Z, that kind of object. And I don't know, this is way too hard for me. I don't know any of that. So there's this proposed analytic model that's now been around for a few decades um, and slowly getting more and more precise how it's, how it's presented, which is a suggestion that this, uh, this so far algebraic object might have a completely analytic model. And the analytic model that's proposed is some version of the following moduli space, that, the, that a space is presenting TMF should be the space of, of super quantum field theories in two dimensions with um, n equals zero one of degree bullet, that's the degree, and they should be compact. And in the next two slides, I'll say what all of those words are supposed to mean. And the, the motivation for this is that there's another completely algebraically defined or could be completely algebraically defined object, which is the theory, which is K theory. You can define K theory completely algebraically in, in an analogous way to the way that CMF is currently defined. But K theory also has a lot of analytic models. In fact, maybe most of us learn K theory first from, from their analytic models. And analytic models of K-theory typically have something to do with super Hilbert spaces and bundles of super Hilbert spaces, and maybe the moduli space of super Hilbert spaces with some extra structure. There's lots of these. They're not all exactly the same. Some of them are homeomorphic, some of them are not. Um, one version that you can extract from these sort of various different analytic models of K-theory is that K-theory can be modeled as the space of super quantum mechanics models. Uh, quantum mechanics model, of course, is the same as um, as a one D quantum field theory, SQFT, um, and with with n equals one supersymmetry. So with one supersymmetry generator, um, this moduli space is it were actually rather this. There's a, really a moduli spectrum of these. There's a sequence of spaces of these, and they they give a model of K theory. Um, so, so that's the, the, the background context. 
So now let me say a little bit just so that about what some of these words mean. So uh, super by super quant, so I'll tell you, you know, I'll try to tell you first what all the words other than compact mean. And SQFT or supersymmetric quantum field theory is supposed to be some sort of actual physical quantum field theory, physical in the sense that it should be Poincaré invariant and unitary. Um, and S just means with some supersymmetry. And the specific case I want of what's called n equals zero one supersymmetry, this is the minimal amount of supersymmetry that a quantum field theory can have in 2D, the minimal non-zero amount. Um, if you more, more precisely, what this means is that there's exactly one supersymmetry in the theory. And on the space time, so on the, the two dimensional world sheet of the theory, the supersymmetry transforms as a right-handed chiral spinner. That's what zero comma one means. The, this means that, it, that it's a right-handed spinner. Um, these, are, these have been around for, for longer than, than any of us, most of us have been. I don't know, there could be some old people in the audience. But, um, the topology that the space of, super, of quantum field theories or super quantum field theories should have if a proposal like this is going to work should be some sort of effective um, topology. It should be a topology that, that imposes an effective field theory idea. So the, the way that I want to imagine that I've topologized this space, of course, I don't have a mathematical definition of these. I don't know mathematically what the points in this set are, but I'm gonna pretend I did. And now I'll talk about the topology. I wanna to put in them as if super quantum field theories were something that mathematicians knew the complete definition for. I think we're really, I mean, Dan talked about ways that this, that were pretty close to this uh, in terms of, of functors from cobordism categories. So once you have this set, um, then you can try to topologize it. The topology that I want is one in which theories with the same low energy behavior are close. Um, that probably doesn't, that slogan probably doesn't completely nail the topology, but um, it, it gives the idea of the topology. And in the quantum mechanics case, I know a particular topology that works for this that I learned from Andre Enriquez, which is that um, what's a quantum mechanics model? Well, a quantum mechanics model or super quantum mechanics model was a some sort of super Hilbert space with an operator called the supersymmetry or maybe an operator called the Hamiltonian. And the topology that works to get this, to get the, um, the theorem, the motivating theorem was that um, you can use the topology of strong convergence of the resolvent of the Hamilton. So that's a topology that, that does the job. I don't think it's the only one, but it's, it's one that does the job. So that's what I want you to imagine is that we're kind of taking, taking the topology of strong convergence of the resolvent of the supersymmetry. So that's what, that's what uh, let's see, I've explained these words so far. So now let me say a little bit about what the degree of a quantum field theory should mean. And this is something that's been um, the idea. We, okay, so as we learned a lot in the first couple of days um, of this workshop, any quantum field theory in general can have a gravitational anomaly. In the, a super quantum field theory, I said Poincaré and Barry, but I could have, should have said kind of spin. So these are spin quantum field theories. In the spin case, we expect the gravitational anomaly to live in the Anderson dual to spin cobordism. And when n is two, the appropriate to sort of the anomaly is measured by um, the difference of central charges of the quantum field theory, which is always an integer. Um, and so, so I, I'll just say that that's the degree of the field theory. Well, more precisely to say I have a field theory of degree three doesn't just mean that the difference of central charges is equal to three. I really should say that I've given the data of that equality. I've given an isomorphism between the anomaly field theory and some reference anomalies. And this is involved in some sign ambiguities. It won't matter in my talk, but you do have to, to do it to be precise. Theo, why the, why the factor of two? Why the factor of two? Because um, the people who first defined central charge didn't notice something that like used a, uh, a normalization that made sense to them at the time and was appropriate for what they were doing. But the minimal chart, the minimal amounts of, of C left minus C right in any quantum field theory in 2D is a half. So the two just makes it, lets me talk about integer degrees. I don't know, maybe the answer to Greg's question is actually no, the mathematicians were wrong. 
for a free firm like a Meyer Rhino Berman? That's right. The minimal, the minimal <laughs> amount of, of anomaly, yeah. the minimal unit of anomaly would be a single chiral fermion. I see. Um, and I think actually the correct answer to Greg's question is the mathematicians got their conventions wrong. Probably we should have decided as mathematicians that cohomology was indexed by half integers where the bosons were, were in the, the sort of the, the what we now call even degree cohomology, the sort of part of cohomology that has the usual sign rules should be indexed by integers and the part of cohomology with the, with the causal sign rules should be in indexed by integers plus a half. That, that probably would have actually been better from the beginning, but I'm stuck with the conventions that people have. Um, I should also mention that the separate central charges, C left and C right, are sort of not very good objects since I'm not talking about conformal field theories, I'm just talking about quantum field theories. But this difference of central charges is a, a very good object. In particular, it's a renormalization group flow invariant um, of a quantum field theory. Well, it's an invariant under any deformation because it measures the anomaly. Um, so now I want to emphasize one other really important word in getting the right moduli space, um, which is the word compact. And this is a notion that, that goes back a long time that, that I think the definition that I think is probably correct was one that I think is due to Siegel. A quantum field theory I'm gonna say is compact. Okay, well, it's not a quite a definition. The, the idea of the definition is that a quantum field theory is compact if its Wick rotated partition function converges absolutely. And now you have to implement that slogan in whatever definition of quantum field theory you have. In quantum mechanics, I know what that means. In quantum mechanics, the Wick rotated evolution is minus is the exponential of minus tau times the Hamiltonian. And to say it converges absolutely on all space times is to say that this operator should be trace class for every positive, um, for every positive imaginary time. Um, in, in, in other models, if you think in terms of path integrals, then I kind of want you to imagine that the path integral converges absolutely. But I don't really want you to imagine that because I don't want you to imagine that every quantum field theory is described by a path integral. Um, compactness is also kind of really implicit when we talk about fully extended quantum topological quantum field theories. Anybody who's from that world, compact fully extended topological quantum field theories are the fully dualizable objects. And of course, there's lots of work that you might be aware of about kind of non-compact quantum TQFTs. Um, they are important in studying, in studying physics and mathematics. Um, some examples, sigma models with compact target are supposed to be examples of compact quantum field theories. Um, and more generally, massive boson, for instance, the harmonic, or, or in other words, the harmonic oscillator. So that's a sigma model with a non-compact target, just the, the real line that the boson takes values in, but it's given a potential energy that compactifies the quantum field theory. So that's the, the typical example you should have in mind of what a compact field quantum field theory is. A non-example non would be a mass disposal. Um, and let me explain why this is really an important condition because already I can point out to you that if we're working with compact quantum field theories, then these spaces are not contractible, at least they're not typically contractible. And the proof of this is that there's a very famous um, a thing that I'll talk about in a little bit more called the Witten genus of a, of a zero comma one field theory. It's an appropriately normalized partition function on non-bounding spin, non-bounding tori. And I, I'm mandating that partition functions are well-defined objects, that they're absolutely convergent. And so this is a thing which can be non-trivial and it's, um, it's well-defined. And then a very famous calculation that I won't remind you points out that actually this is a locally constant map, that the partition function of every quantum field theory is a weakly holomorphic modular form, and that it actually depends locally constantly on the quantum field theory. And so, so the existence of the Witten genus convinces you that, my, that the space of compact field theories um, is already not trivial. It's not, contract, not trivial topologically. I want to, to contrast this with the case if I dropped compactness. If I dropped compactness, then you could deform a quantum field theory through a non-compact example, and it wouldn't have a partition a Witten genus. And so there's no reason for the Witten genus to be constant because it's not even existing. 
And this um, means in particular that I think it's, so Cyberg a couple of years ago at um, Strings conjectured that um, for any fixed anomaly dimension and any amount of supersymmetry at all, if you take the space of non-compact quantum field theories, that moduli space is contractible. So it's really important that we put compactness in the definition. Um, so already, okay, this is a nice conjecture for physicists to think about. Maybe it's the first question I'm, I really wanna flag is, is see if, if you believe Zyberg's conjecture. Okay, so that's the, the context. So now let me explore um, this, this proposal um, of how, of how SQFT should work. Um, Greg asks, is there, there is some nice literature showing that elliptic genera of some non-compact objects are mock modular forms. Greg is completely correct. And I'm not gonna address it in this talk. Um, but I will point out- It wasn't defined, but I think it is defined. Um, well, let me point out that the mock modular forms for those some, so it's not true for all non-compact CFTs. Um, you need only mildly, the, the, the non-compactness has to be quite mild. And if you deform one of these, you can actually just deform the mock modular form. It's not a, an invariant of the, uh, like it's not a deformation invariant. It doesn't, so that's still consistent with the fact that okay. the space okay. of these is, um, might yeah. be contractible. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I want to to say some things that that um, that I really don't know the answer to now. So, so my first sort of thing I really want physicists to to tell me. Um, physicists have told me that that spaces of quantum field theories in general should have a flow on them called the renormalization group flow. It's one of the most important things that modern physicists care about. Um, and and the, the slogan is that renormalization group flow is a thing which rescales the metric and a priori it's fixed points would be scale invariant theories. If you make the words, if you can somehow force the word scale invariant to be a sufficiently local notion, then the RG fixed points are the conformal or in the case of supersymmetric field theories, super conformal field theories. Um, RG flow in different dimensions feels very different and it feels different depending on whether you're talking about unitary field theories or not. In the two-dimensional case um, for unitary field theory, Zamolodzikov basically explains that our RG flow is a Morse flow. He writes down an explicit function, which, well, his function isn't quite the Morse function, but some modification of it is a Morse function for RG flow. I, I'm saying it's a Morse function, but it's not a Morse function. It's just definitely not a Morse function. It definitely, the, the, I told you that what the critical points of the flow are, they're super conformal field theories. Probably the space of superconformal field theories is a finite dimensional manifold, or at least is sort of finite dimension. So in some sense, one would expect that this is a more spot problem. Um, and making this, this kind of clarifying this would be really good to do. As I said, I'm telling you things I don't know the answer to. Whether Morse flow, whether this picture of quantum field theory is useful or not will depend a lot on whether you can actually do Morse theory with it. And one of the things when you do Morse theory is you'd like to be able to flow any uh, point in your space to a fixed point, because then if you are, then you can model your space, you can build it up from the bottom um, just by looking at the, at the critical loss. So big question that, that Greg tells me he thinks the answer is no for, so I'll just already anticipate that. Um, is is the is the downward RG flow um, does it keep you in the world of compact theories? So it's spelled out. What I'm asking is, if I give you a 2D, let's say, super conformal field theory, super conformal field theory. Um, if I have a super conformal field theory and I know it's compact, at um, is its deep IR limit again compact? Um, and, and I think, well, I, I haven't, anyway, we can, this is a question I'm not going to discuss my, my beliefs about it. I think it would be really nice if this were true, because if it were true, then the space of super quantum field theories could, as I said, could be studied more theoretically. You could model this space by, by saying, rather than trying to define what are all super quantum field theories, I could just define the super conformal field theories. That's a much easier, that's a much more 
within reach notion in mathematics to in sort of mathematical physics. And then maybe you can figure out what the RG flow lines are between super conformal field theories. And then the whole topology of the space would be a kind of zigzag topology where two points in the space are connected by a path if you can flow by a zigzag of RG flows between super conformal field theories. So I think it would be really interesting to develop I think it would, it might be within reach for mathematicians to build a model of possibly TMF, certainly a model of some elliptic cohomology theory whose points are not all super quantum field theories, but whose points are the super conformal field theories, except with kind of zigzags of RG flows as the topology. And then I also want to just flag, okay, I even covered it up, you can't see it, that um, none of these spaces are really spaces. They really are inherently stacks. The space of super conformal field theories really does have, have um, points with lots of automorphisms. And so you really want to do all of this. Um, you'd really need a sort of Morse theory of stacks instead. Maybe that exists. I don't know. It's not my area of expertise. Okay. So this is about the moduli space of super quantum field theories. Um, and now I'd like to tell you why it's supposed to be a spectrum. If I want to, if I want to claim that it's a model of TMF or that it's a possible model of TMF, I should tell you why, why it's a spectrum. Sorry, can you say um, again why it's uh, supposed to be a stack? So there are theories with automorphism, but we are not really cautioning by these uh, morphisms, right? Well, I've been very cavalierly talking about the set of all of these, but there isn't, a, you know, in any definition, that set isn't a set. It's, it's, um, you know, if you, if you like. I just think it's probably true that in the in, in, by the end of the century that we will have abandoned spaces anyway, and we'll just be working with stacks. Um, but but the all of the proposed definitions I've ever seen of what a quantum field theory is have some sort of higher categorical structure built into them. Yeah, I, I don't understand the question. The mo you're talking about the space of quantum field theories. If it has automorphisms, it's surely it's, that's a stacking yeah. point. I think that I think that Greg was repeated. Even without taking an orbital or anything, if the if that point has automorphisms, it's it's stacking. Mm -hmm. But, but why is that important in the study of like topology of this? So if we want to build um, a TMF model, do I really care that? Oh, I don't know. Has... I don't know the answer to, to that second question, um, except that that it could like you. You do typically think that a point with stackiness should be contributing topology. The stackiness it, um, contributes topology that's roughly like BG for G, the amount of stackiness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I expect that if you wanted to do this, you should write down sp spaces or stacks of super conformal field theories where you think that each that the space of super conformal field theories is maybe maybe it's the geometric realization of the stack of super conformal field theories. Yeah, I see. Maybe that would be the right thing. But then I worry that 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 the more justifying this more theoretic picture might become worse if you take geometric realizations. And maybe you should to justify a more theoretic picture. You should work with actual stacks um, in a geometric context where you can do where you can do more stuff where you can can take derivatives and that kind of thing. Yeah, tangent yeah. spaces. Thanks. Um, but again, this is all things I don't know. This is, I wanna to encourage people to go forth and, and, and study these. Um, so I wanna now tell you what the, what the spectrum structure on the space of quantum field theories is supposed to be. Um, the base point that I'd like to pick, to tell you of a spectrum, I've told you a sequence of spaces. They were the spaces with uh, quantum field theories with prescribed gravitational anomaly. The first thing that I have to tell you to tell you that it's a spectrum is I have to make these pointed spaces. And the base point I'd like to pick is the zero theory, the zero TQFT. This is the TQFT that for any non-empty input, for any non-empty space time, the partition function is identically zero. For any Hilbert, for any non-empty space, the, the Hilbert space of the theory is identically zero dimensional. Um, that's a perfectly good TQFT in the sort of standard sense of TQFTs. Um, I don't know if it's a perfectly good quantum field theory in your definition of quantum field theory, so I want to flag that. But that's the idea of the base point. And now, uh, a quantum field, a super quantum field theory in general, as far as I can tell, a good mathematical definition, people talk about the word spontaneous supersymmetry breaking. 
And the best definition I've heard for what it means to say that supersymmetry is spontaneously broken in a way that a mathematician can understand is if the operator, just the identity operator is a super descent, which is to say it's super, it's Susie exact. You, you are supposed to think of a supersymmetry as some sort of differential or curve differential on your, your field theory. You're supposed to think of a field theory as some sort of linear object, maybe it's an algebra. And the supersymmetry you're supposed to think of as some sort of differential. And so you can ask, is the operator one a Susie descendant? And this happens if and only if every um, closed operator is actually exact, just for the same reasons that it holds in, the, in, in any, like in the DGA case. And so being, having spontaneous supersymmetry breaking is like your theory is acyclic. Um, what should be true, at least what I hope you will arrange the topology on this space to, and to do is that a theory should have spontaneous supersymmetry breaking exactly when its deep IR limit is the zero quantum field theory. Somehow the deep IR limit should be concentrating you on the, the supersymmetric ground states. And the operator one being a super descendant tells you there are no supersymmetric ground states. Um, but this is just a request that you engineer the topology that way. Um, an example that I have in mind of a theory with, with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking is if you take a single, an example that I want you to keep in mind because it's gonna come back in the next slide is that if you take a single chiral fermion, so that's a, a perfectly good um, conformal field theory, it's purely left moving, which means that to give it a right moving supersymmetry, I have a lot of freedom. Um, and an example of a zero comma one supersymmetry that I can put on this theory is to use the, the supersymmetry generated by the, the fermion itself. Um, I wanna flag that although this chiral fermion is a conformal field theory, as a super quantum field theory, this theory is not super conformal. It flows under the RG flow. And I can tell you how it flows. If you flow it to length scale L, uh, you haven't changed the fermion itself, but you've changed the supersymmetry. And so in the, the kind of large limit, um, the supersymmetry is getting stronger and stronger. And, and a good way to handle this is to kind of basically think that the, the, um, the fermion itself is kind of evaporating away and the theory flows to zero. Um, and so I, I want to invite you to arrange its apology in which this, this holds. Um, or argue back at me that it shouldn't hold. Um, in any case, I'm, I'm not completely confident about the idea of zero as a valid quantum field theory at all, because it's, the, it's one of these weird quantum field theories for which it doesn't itself have a well-defined anomaly theory, for instance. It's a meaningful theory for any anomaly. And, and so certainly in some models of what quantum field theory should be, zero is not a valid quantum field theory. And in that case, I, I lose my base point but I still could have a notion of what spontaneous supersymmetry breaking means, which is an a priori notion. And then rather than talking about a single base point for my stack, maybe I'll, or for my space, it would have been good enough to give you a contractible space of base points. That, I don't need to, if I wanna give you a, a spectrum, I don't have to give you one base point. I could give you a contractible space of base points. And maybe it's true in your model. Maybe you have a model of quantum field theory in your mind. So I wanna ask in your model, is it the case that the space of theories with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, is that space, that subspace contractible? If it is, then it's good enough for, for um, building a spectrum. If not, you'd have to work a little bit more. You'd have to say, force it to be contractible. So there's, a, there's another question for physicists to work on. So that's the base point. Now that I have a base point, I can try to give you a loop spectrum structure. Um, the loop spectrum structure is the following. Well, what would a loop in the space of quantum field theories be? It would be a map from the real numbers to the space of quantum field theories with, um, I'll just call X the parameter. And to make it a loop, it would be a, a thing which kind of as X goes to either in plus or minus infinity should approach zero. We should have a kind of supersymmetry break. If I have a, loop, a path of field theories, I can imagine dynamicalizing the parameter. These are kind of perfectly good things that physicists do all the time. How do you dynamicalize a parameter? Well, very explicitly, I want to work with n equals zero one theories. And so to dynamicalize it, I have to promote it to a zero comma one scalar multiplet. 
Um, and just explicitly let me remind that that consists of uh, a boson and its right moving super partner. The, the super partner is just on the right. I'll call the result of dynamic closing just the integral over X of my family. Um, the example that I told you about was if I take, let's take for sort of a single right, sorry, a single left moving fermion, and I'll just um, rescale. I told you a supersymmetry generator, I'll just scale it by X. Remember, X is just a parameter. Um, now, when I when I dynamicalize X, the full result of dynamicalizing it is, well, I already had the chiral bose fermion from my original theory. I have the boson X that, that I got from dynamicalizing. I have an anti-chiral fermion, the super part, which is the super part of X. And you can work out the Lagrangian. Here it is. Uh, and that's wrong. You can work out the Lagrangian, but it's wrong. One of those should be a D bar, which should be a D bar, something like that. Well, actually, um, they are. I'm, I'm actually quite yeah. confused. So you said that uh, lambda is, is wrong? chiral, but the supersymmetry was, oh, I see. The supersymmetry had the opposite chirality from lambda. Um, That's right. My supersymmetry is, is purely anti-chiral. So it should pair a chiral object with a scalar. Like just a, yeah. So when you said the supercharge is lambda, it's a little confusing because the supercharge should be anti-chiral, right? It's zero, one supersymmetry in your previous slide. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite confused about that D and D bar issue. In your previous slide, you said this, this, I thought maybe I misread it. You said the supercharge was L to the one half times lambda. Um, good. So what I, maybe I wrote the wrong maybe formula. You mean the dual of lambda of some, some yeah, kind? Yeah, of... what do I want? I want something like the, the thing which differentiates and sort of takes D by D lambda. So what I want is something like that the super, that the, what I, what I want is something like, um, I want something like the supersymmetry operator of lambda should be one. Like the, the okay, okay, so then G, good. So then G has the opposite curve. Okay, now that's, yeah. that's good now. And, and I thought I wrote down a current that did that. Like I think the, I think if you integrate lambda in a circle, like what is this? This is like the, the integral of kind of inserting the supercurrent kind of, and then the supercurrent gets sort of integrated in a circle around it. Um, and I thought that that was, anyway, I thought that that, um, that this was the right formula, but this is what I had in mind, um, is that operator. And that operator does indeed square to the right moving. So this operator squares to zero and this theory has um, is trivial on the right. And so that does indeed square to the right, to the correct, um, right moving Hamilton, so, um, like the L zero bar. Thank you. Yeah, that's much clearer. Um, and as I said, this was, this was wrong. Um, so, okay, the, with, with exercise, because I can't do it, I wrote the wrong formula, but the thing you're supposed to conclude is that after doing this procedure, um, the theory becomes massive. And, and another way of saying that is that the deep by uh, the massive, the theory, like the, the results of this integration is not a TQFT, it's a massive dynamical quantum field theory. But if you flow it to the deep IR, you get the TQFT called one. This is the TQFT whose precision function is identically one, its Hilbert space is identically one dimensional and so on. So, what I'd like you to do now is um, now I can tell you kind of what should be an equivalence between these, between either taking paths in the space of quantum field theories or quantum field theories of degree one less. Let me point out that this dynamicization procedure does indeed change the degree by one. 
it changes the degree exactly because of the, the super partner being kind of turned on. So it does change the, the gravitational anomaly. Um, so on the one hand, if I have a family of theories, I can dynamicalize and get a theory in one degree lower. And on the other hand, um, if I have a theory in one degree lower, I can just tensor with this family of theories and get a family of theories. Um, and, and I have talked myself into believing that these two maps are uh, homotopy equivalents. Um, of course, there's some things that should be handled, like is it, you know, when is it true that actually, like how, basically, I said I had a family of theories. Presumably for the results of dynamicalizing to be compact, that family had better kind of approach zero quick enough. And so having some clarity about exactly how quickly the family has to approach zero um, would really be nice to, to do. Um, okay, so that's supposed to tell you why this should be a spectrum. Okay, so so let's let's talk about some things once you sort of have, have come to believe this um, Siegel Stolzteigner proposal. So I mentioned already that there's a, this Witten genus from the space of super quantum field theories to the space of modular forms. Um, I should say I'm doing, I'm like indexing cohomologically. So this actually takes me from, a, a, um, it ends up in modular forms of weight uh, minus bullet over two um, for, because I'm using cohomological indexing. Um, the formula is really straightforward. I think Dan also wrote it down. You can take the Ramon sector Hilbert space for your quantum field theory, which is to say the Hilbert space on a circle with non-bounding spin structure. And you can take the partition function for non-bounding spin structure in the time direction. Putting non-bounding spin structure in the time direction is, is the sort of either taking the super trace or taking the trace with a minus one of the F inserted. Any contribution from Q bar drops out. So you just have a, a Q to the L zero minus um, the central charge, left moving central charge. This is completely standard. And um, then I'm going to, I'm just going to put in a factor of an eta function, which is a convenient normalization. And then there's a completely convention dependent square of uh, eighth root of unity that I should also put in that I'm going to, that doesn't really affect things very much. Um, and and just to remind, by eta, I mean zeta kinds eta, it's a 24th root of the modular discernment. So this is, this is a sort of by now quite well known object from, um, that you can do with quantum field theories. And it's supposed to match another quite well known object, which has the same name, which is called the Witten, also the Witten genus, which was on kind of top T TMF itself, also landing in modular forms. I wanna flag that these are a priori given very different formulas. Here I gave a kind of nice physics formula and um, my pen has decided to stop working, which means I don't know why, maybe it's out of power. Um, sorry, my, my points here decided to stop. Um, so the, the the Witten genus for modular forms, if you like think that, mod, that TMF is defined the way I said about derived algebraically, then the Witten genus is, is given by an edge map on spec from in a certain spectral sequence. Anyway, it's something that's been calculated. Another question I wanna propose that's a sort of another physics question. Um, so if you look at the formula at the top of the page that I cannot seem to point to because my pencil, my Apple pencil has died. Um, then the, there would be a reason for us, you to just get a power of eta, for you to just, or in, in particular, just a power of, of delta, um, if also supersymmetry made the Q dependence drop out. Which is to say that one reason why you might end up just with powers of, of delta is if you, if your supersymmetry enhanced from zero comma one to actually one comma one then the, the, the Witten genus would just be a, a count um, and not actually a modular form. 
And so another question that I think we should we should work on when we're engineering, like when we're talking about kind of really probing this this proposal, is 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 it true that in fact every value that you expect every um, so we know which powers of which multiples of powers of delta should arise as the Witten genera of CMF classes. Is it true that they all arise as the Witten genera of theories with one comma one supersymmetry? Like I think we should, when we're when we're trying to build those, that's where to look. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep sort of powering through with a bunch of questions because that's the fun part. Okay. Um, other things, so more precisely, what Hopkins calculated was that we know exactly which multiples of, so powers of eta don't arise except for, um, I'm really annoyed that my Apple Pencil died. Powers of eta don't arise except for um, powers of delta, and that has an easy explanation in terms of modularity. Um, and not every power of delta is the Witten genus of a TMF class. Rather, the um, k delta to the m is a Witten genus exactly when k times m is divisible by 24. But so another way of saying that is that the minimum k, so that k delta m arises, is 24 divided by the GCD of 24 and m. And, um, and I know how to engineer some of these minimal powers of delta. Um, for instance, John Duncan's um, Super moonshine field theory um, is is something you can go look up. It's it's a lovely paper, and it realizes twenty. The left moving version realizes twenty four delta inverse. The right moving version realizes twenty four delta. Um, as an example, something you can do from this is that well, you can then take powers say of the right moving version. Then you realize twenty four to the m times delta to the m. That's twenty four to the m is some astronomically large number. You could also do the permutation orbifold um, of this power, and you'll realize some power, some also astronomically large number. And a cute calculation of Gaioto, that was basically just Mathematica, he went and asked Mathematica, um, shows that indeed the GCD of these two numbers does is the minimum expected um, K. Um, what that means is that I can actually, I do know how to engineer uh, um, all of these TMF classes, all of these sort of expected classes um, by like some massive linear combination. You take sort of thousands and thousands of powers of super moonshine and thousands and thousands of, of cop, so thousands and thousands of copies of, of the direct sum of thousands and thousands of powers of super moonshine, direct sum of thousands and thousands of orbifolds and arrange the signs so that there's a massive cancellation. This is a, a terrible solution to the question of actually engineering interesting Witten genuses. Um, it would be much better to engineer one with only one vacuum. So it's another question I think people should, should explore from the quantum field theory perspective from like, is is go and engineer quantum filters with a single vacuum and a very small non-zero um, sort of Witten genus. Maybe just anti-holomorphic superconformal field theories where the Witten genus is just a number. So how about uh, one common one sigma models? Is there any hope of engineering uh, this from sigma model? Uh, I think that's a great question and I don't know the answer because I don't know the I don't know much about sigma models. Okay, thanks. Um, like, well, I will say I'm not aware. Of, I think it's it's a wide open question to find a sigma model that actually, well, it's not maybe that wide open. Um, Hopkins can give you some sort of vague plumbing description of a sigma model that realizes 24 delta but it's not a very explicit thing and it doesn't have like in the in the in the su sort of duncan super moonshine theory for instance has a has a beautiful automorphism group um it's conway's largest sporadic group and um it's not at all clear whether you should expect to be able to you know how much you should be able to lift of those automorphisms to a sigma model um 
And of course, there might be lots of theories that realize the same TNF class because they only have to be related by some complicated path. They could have different numbers of vacua. They, they could have different sort of central charges. They have to have the same anomalies, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in particular, I don't know of a quantum field theory of a sigma model, which actually flows to Duncan's super moonshine in the deep IR. Maybe the, this plumbing model of, of Hopkins does, but um, but probably not. And, and that might be a very kind of geometry dependent, like it might be very sensitive to what geometry to put on, on that man, on that 24 man, dimensional man. Yeah, right. Thanks. Um, what other things don't I know how to do? I don't know how to engineer theta series. So another result from Hopkins calculations was that for any even unimodular lattice, the corresponding theta series is in the image of um, the Witten genus map. Um, and an example, the first example is that if you take the E8 lattice, then you get the weight for Eisenstein shift series. And it would be really nice to write down zero comma one field theories that, that, that whose Witten genus is are these theta series on the nose? Maybe a construction that starts with a lattice. Um, I don't even know how to do this for the first lattice for the EA lattice. Let me give you a non-solution to point out that this that what's hard. So a thing you could have tried to do was just take the holomorphic lattice V away. So just a, a, a purely holomorphic bosonic conformal field theory, which is a, a a uh, left moving boson probing the torus still to the lattice. Um, it's, it has zero comma one supersymmetry for a stupid reason because the right moving sector is trivial. Um, and you can ask, what is its, what is its Witten genus? Perfectly good question. The answer is not the theta series because um, the answer is the theta series divided by some power of eta. Um, and, and of course it's not because this is a purely holomorphic object. And so it's, and it's central, it's, so it's a thing I really wish I could write with my pencil and I just think I need to get a new Apple pencil. Uh, here we go, okay. Um, so of course this is an object with, with C left, C right is um, the rank of L zero. Whereas the theta series, should be realized by something whose C right is more than its C left and differing by the rank of L divided by two. So there's no, there's no, so this, this, so this is just definitely a non-solution. Another non-solution would be to take this, the torus dual to the lattice and take the full sigma model with that target, perfectly good object. Um, and it's, but it's just a torus. So it's completely flat. So it's Witten genus vanishes identically. And one way to see that it's Witten genus vanishes is to just point out that the result has, has fermions zero modes, which just kill the Witten genus. So my well, best guess for this problem would be- modes to find another nice genus. I mean, that, right? that's sort of never a big deal, Theo. I mean, you could just insert fermion zero modes and then you get another- You genus. cannot do that insertion in a way that preserves supersymmetry. That operator wasn't. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe maybe there is a, a short way to answer this problem. I couldn't do it, but maybe it's just my own blinders. I'm not sure I believe that because I mean there are ways of counting BPS states where you, all you do is you answer. Anyway, I had another question though. So I'm getting now confused about Q and Q bar. I mean, your supersymmetry was on the right, and you had yes. trace of minus one. So strictly speaking, did you really want to say trace minus one to the FQ bar to the L naught bar minus C over 24? Yeah, I should have, that's right. I should have said, well, okay. This, I, yeah, I should have, there. I could and have it's, inserted. It would just be annoying to put the bars on everything. But no, I mean, I really, I did mean what I wrote. Oh, um, you did. I could okay. have inserted uh, also a Q bar Right, I could but, have inserted a uh, Q bar to the L zero bar minus C right zero. on twenty four, but but this will just this won't contribute to the trace. Okay, good. Just the, the standard supersymmetry cancellation. It doesn't sure. matter whether you write that or not. Okay. So why was the uh, lattice theory wrong then? 
I mean, couldn't you multiply the uh, Duncan uh, super moonshine by a lattice? Um, that would get you off by a factor of powers of 24. Ah, okay. Too many ground states. Yeah. I thought there, there is a eight manifold, the eight bond manifold, um, that the single model on that will give uh, this weight four isotope series. You this take the year plumbing and then the uh, boundary is some exotic uh, seven sphere. So you take uh, 28 copies and then cap that off. Um, yes, I believe that this is true. But I'd really like a, I'd really like a, a construction a CFT construction. Maybe. I'd really right. I'd really like a CFT construction. Somehow, I think some of the most interesting quantum field theories. Maybe this is my own bias. Some of the most interesting quantum field theories are like these deep IR, purely quantum objects that don't arise at necessarily as a sigma model. Um, I'd really like a construction that just inputs a lattice and outputs a CFT. Yeah, I see. And. Um, and that, that since it's true for every unimodular lattice, it should be something you can just do. That's just like a lattice theoretic construction. Um, but I haven't found it yet. Maybe, maybe there isn't one, I don't know. I, maybe Greg will construct one while, while he, for, during the rest of the talk and then he can like explain it. He'll, he'll explain how to handle the zero modes that, that I don't know how to do, but um, okay. Hopping's uh, statement is that everything is in the image, right? So, for example, one got 24 delta, but not delta. That's right. 24 delta is in the image, delta is not. Um, okay, I'm going to power through for a couple other things that I think would be interesting to study, and I can already tell I'm not going to be able to say everything before the before Duke cuts me off. Um, or he'll let me run late. I don't know. Maybe people will just leave on their own accord. Um, Quantum field theories, as we've heard a lot in, in this workshop, it's interesting to study quantum field theories which come with a, a symmetry by a, a group G. I'm gonna call that a flavor symmetry just to distinguish it from gauge redundancy. Um, I don't know, I think some, some parts of high energy physics use that language or some parts of particle physics use that. Um, let me remind that, that there's a perfectly good theory of anomalies. I maybe won't go, maybe won't remind the details of it. The total anomaly for a quantum field theory, well, there's a piece which is just the degree of the quantum field theory, and then there's the part that we normally think of as the anomaly, which is like the rest. The, the, the part we normally think of as the anomaly is like the part of spin cobordism other than the degree, so the reduced spin cobordism of the group. Um, and what you should expect is you should expect that if you take everything I've told you so far and just enhance it with G symmetry and prescribed anomaly, then you'll get a model of TMF. TMF G equivariant TMF has been constructed by Lurie. It can indeed be twisted by anomalies of this type. So, um, so this is a, a meaningful expectation. I'd also like to remind something that I think we've also heard in this workshop that a good way, not the only good way, but a good way to study a quantum field theory with some symmetry is to replace that standalone quantum field theory by a boundary condition for a gauge theory. You can take G gauge theory, you can place a boundary condition on it, which is basically your theory Q with Neumann boundary for the gauge fields. And, and the map that takes G to, that takes Q to boundary conditions for gauge theory is an, is an isomorphism um, because to get your original theory back, you put the Dirichlet boundary on the other side and, and just zoom up. The Dirichlet boundary comes with a G action. So you do get Q back as a thing with a G action. Um, that's quite standard. So once you've decided that theories with a G symmetry are in the same, at least maybe for finite groups, maybe for groups where you really feel like you understand gauge theory, you can decide that theories with a G symmetry are the same as boundary conditions for some bulk theory. Then you can start asking about um, more general types of quote symmetry where the bulk theory isn't a gauge theory. And these are start, starting to be called words like non-invertible symmetry or categorical symmetry. Um, and um, for at least for finite categorical symmetries, we know what the most general type of symmetry a 2D SQFT can have. The symmetry would be described by any 3D TFT. These are super, so spin objects. 
3D spin TFTs are described by um, spin modular tensor categories, or rather, sorry, supermodular tensor categories. So you should expect that for any supermodular tensor category, you know, this is maybe now a conjecture. I don't think anyone's done this completely. Um, that for any supermodular tensor category, there should be a meaningful notion of TMF um, equivariant for that modular tensor category. Um, this is now, I'm switched from physics conjectures to math conjectures. Mathematicians, please go and build this. And I should say, part of the work has already been done for you. So Enriquez and Morrison have built this over the rational numbers. Um, and their, their construction is not trivial. Like what they, the content of their, of their theorem is actually an investigation of Galois actions on the mapping class group representations of Rishitik and Tarayevta. Um, but this should be done in, not just rationally, but integrally it hasn't been done. Um, I think the fact that I want super is not gonna be a big deal. And then also um, the assignment, it's sort of natural to think it would be functorial for, for topological interfaces, which in the math literature are called um, super wit equivalences. So any mathematician who, who likes building things in, in pure homotopy, please do this. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going until Du tells me to stop this. Is, I'm gonna do the same thing Dan did. Um, another thing that you can do with when you start thinking about flavor symmetries, another way of understanding theories with the flavor symmetry is to place your quantum field theory on a world sheet with a background gauge bundle. Um, and some people use the word fugacity for the strength of the background bundle. Um, at least that's a word I've heard and I think that's the definition. I've been talking about quantum field theories which I asked to be compact. A weaker notion than compactness of the whole quantum field theory is what I'm gonna call flavored compactness. The whole theory was compact. A G equivariant theory would be compact if its wick rotated partition function converges absolutely for any G bundle. But a weaker thing you could ask is for the, the um, partition function to converge as long as the frugacity is non-zero. But I'll allow the, the partition function to diverge when the G bundle goes to zero. An example of where this is interesting is you could take a sigma model with target just the, the complex numbers and take the group U1 just acting in the usual way. Well, if you ask what happens to a string probing this, this target space with non-zero fugacity, the string can't get very far away from the origin because if it tries to get far away from the origin, well, the, the symmetry rotates the other end of the string to somewhere else. And so the string gets pulled hotter and hotter the further away from the origin it gets. So the end result is that at non-zero fugacity, I'm actually looking at a harmonic oscillator. And so this is a theory which is flavored compact. And indeed, you can write down the kind of Witten genus as a function of the fugacity in a problem like this. And the, the naive thing you write down will diverge when the fugacity goes to zero, but will be a meaningful kind of uh, miromorphic Jacobi object. Um, so, so let me just ask, maybe I'll ask the mathematicians to, to investigate flavored compactness. Flavored, this is like flavored compactness is just a thing that, that physicists have already been investigating. For instance, when Greg was referencing the fact that some non-compact CFTs can give you mock modular forms, one of the ways that those arise is from flavored compact theories. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways that they arise. And um, so some things that we should do. We should, there's a thing that people already know called level N TMF. And it's almost TMF equivariant for the cyclic group Z mod N. It's not, it's probably the flavored compact version of TMF. So we should build a version of flavored compact TMF, which, which realizes that. We should also build versions of flavored compact bordism spectra. See, if you just add, let your bordisms be completely non-compact, then every bordism is fill, every manifold is fillable because you just like fill it with a non-compact filling. But if you ask for bordisms with some, some extra symmetry, then you can have something possibly interesting. Um, so uh, let's see, what, do I, what are some examples? I already mentioned that, that flavored compact theories, for example, can give you um, miromorphic Jacobi forms. Um, and so one should expect kind of miromorphic, like topological miromorphic Jacobi forms to be an interesting object. 
uh, if you can build flavored compact bordism spectra, then um, you should still be able to do things like say take S1 with its action by rotation. And then here I told you C was a perfectly good flavored compact manifold and um, for the U1 symmetry. And um, I'll think of like a filling of S1 that just sort of opens up to C. And the reason why I care about sort of geometries, trumpet fillings like this is because of some work that, that on, on mock modular forms and on understanding sort of formulas that, that come up that you see in the literature. There's a lot of formulas in mock modular form theory that have that seem like what they're doing is taking non-compact manifolds with sort of mildly non-compact manifolds and, and adding on kind of trumpets, plugging the filling, plugging the non-compactness with a trumpet. So um, those are some, but, but especially the mathematicians just in general, I think um, defining and, and analyzing flavored compact structures would be an interesting problem to do. Okay, um, let me just mention a few other things that I don't know how to do. Um, topological modular forms, just like ordinary modular forms, it's interesting to ask about the behavior of the modular form at the cusp um, at I infinity. Um, and the, the thing that, that I've been talking about pure sort of full, you know, what the kind of all caps version of TMF um, kind of allows um, any pole at the cusp. It's, it corresponds to, to, to what you might call um, kind of weakly holomorphic modular forms in the modular form literature. It's holomorphic at finite values of tau, but can have any pole at the cusp. But it's also possible to ask about modular forms with poles where you bound the degree of the pole. And you can write down spectral versions of these. You can, for instance, the thing that's called mixed caps TMF is the space of topological modular forms, which are holomorphic at the cusp. And there's a thing called topological cusp forms, which are the topological modular forms um, which vanish at the cusp. Now, I wanna flag that when I said, which are holomorphic and which vanish? Well, I don't just mean that as a property. This is, this is homotopy theory. So we, a, a mixed TMF class comes with the data of how the class is holomorphic at the cusp. It's not just a subset. Um, I'm gonna give this slide out of order because I wanna sort of flag that, that um, unlike for ordinary modular forms, there are holomorphic modular topological modular forms of negative weight. Um, and a and, uh, first example, in general, we know what all of, what they all are because Stoyanos could um, show there's a wonderful duality for the mixed TMF, mixed caps TMF version. But as an example in um, pi minus 21, so that's weight minus 21 halves, there's a holomorphic modular form, which um, a topologist might call delta inverse nu. Delta inverse is the thing that, that Every number theorist knows about nu is the, this um, S3 with its Lie group plane. And this should be compared to the fact that, that for the all caps, TMF, um, it's zero. So there's a, this interesting TM, sort of this interesting object, this interesting conformal field theory or something, which is, which is holomorphic at the cusp, but, no, and no homotopic, but, um, the null homotopy moves it away from being holomorphic at the cusp. So it'd be really interesting to describe these physically. Roughly speaking, um, saying bounding the pole at the cusp is something like bounding the spectrum of L0 in the Ramon sector. This is something you can write down. I mean, you can, you can give a definition, but I don't know what the physics of it is. It's not a very physically reasonable thing to do. Um, this is not just the same as bounding the central charges. Bounds on the central charges would give you a bound on the spectrum of L0, but it might not be as strong as you need it to be. Um, for instance, just looking at central charges wouldn't have told you that delta inverse nu is holomorphic at the cusp. Um, and now I'll, I guess I'll, I'll end up just doing one last slide. Um, because Stu is letting me go late. Um, to just mention, you know, yet more things that I think should be done. So elliptic cohomology was developed somewhat hand in hand with, with notions from Moonshine um, back in the, in the 1990s. 
and, and they, they've always had a little bit of interplay to them. And, um, and this maybe isn't too much of a surprise. Maybe it was just the fact that like elliptic function, like elliptic objects, modular objects were, were and remain really hot. And so anytime you have something that produces modular objects, you might ask, oh, maybe does my machine that produces modular objects, is that related to your machine that produces modular objects? And by now, maybe the answer is probably no, because modular objects, there's too many of them, but maybe the answer is yes. So let me just tell you something about moonshine. So moonshine is in general, it's about G equivariant modular objects. Um, for instance, maybe you could do something with G equivariant um, topological modular forms. If you ask what is the space of cusps for G equivariant topological modular forms, the space of cusps is roughly speaking the, the adjoint quotient G mod G. It's not quite that the Galois actions are different, but it has that basic flavor. Um, over the complex numbers, it's, it's the adjoint quotient G mod G. And, um, and so if you have a G equivariant modular object, it's interesting to ask about its growth at all of the different cusps. Moonshine focuses attention on things which grow in some way near the cusp, the, the sort of identity cusp. This is like the I infinity cusp and um, grow less quickly. They're, they're, they're smoother at all the other cusps and different moonshines have different degrees and different um, precise growth rates, but they all have this flavor that it, what, makes, uh, what makes moonshine objects better than regular modular objects is this kind of quite constrained growth. Let me give an example for anyone who's ever kind of listened to a lecture about monstrous moonshine, which is that I told you that Zn modular forms are, are roughly speaking level n modular functions, modular forms, or it's just to say modular forms that are modular for, um, for the congruence group called gamma naught n. Um, the cusp E in kind of, it, so G is going to be going to be the cyclic group. The cusp E is basically the cusp at I infinity. And the other cusps are the finite cusps in this translation. If you had, say, just a weight zero modular form, so just a modular function, and if you knew that it grew as Q inverse at I infinity and that it was bounded at all other cusps, well, it's, then it's a map that um, it, it ends up having to be a hopped module. It, it ends up having to be an isomorphism between um, upper half, the sort of modular, the level and modular curve and just the, the um, genus zero curve. So this type of imposing this type of growth rate is one of the ways to impose the genus zero property in modular forms, modular in moonshine. It's not the only way, but it's a way of building the, the genus zero property. And it's the way that, that the kind of modern moonshines, the umbral moonshines build, you know, it's, there, it's the version of genus zero that you see in, in umbral moonshine. So I think it'd be really interesting to study kind of topological modular forms with this type of mixed cuspidal behavior. Um, and I'll end on one last one that's sort of about moonshine and not really about cuspidal behavior, which is that in monstrous moonshine in particular and not in the more recent umbral moonshines, um, there are also hopped modulin for groups that aren't contained in SL2Z. And uh, these have been somewhat explained by work of, of Paquette and Person and Volpato, um, but um, their and their explanation is physical. It has to do with superconformal field theories, and, and but it's not an explanation that, that I see how to translate into TMF. Now, maybe it doesn't translate, but it would be interesting to ask, does, does TMF, is it kind of, um, does, it, does TMF have room for, um, for, um, Modularity is not contained in SL2. So um, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very stimulating talk. So any questions from the audience? Yes, uh, I, have a, I have a comment actually related to one of the conjecture. First of all, it's a beautiful Please. talk. I really like the fact that you reviewed questions and this is very rare. We see so many open questions in this field. So thanks for that. Uh, one of the questions that you asked, I think we probably know the answer to, and that is the okay. one that you said about the, um, whether or not the compactness property is RG invariant. That is, you yeah. stay at that class when you slow down. 
And the answer to that is no. And the easy example of this is that you take a SIG model on a hydrobolic manifold, for example, on a Riemann surface. That's a compact model, but in the RG yeah. flow becomes non-compact. So that's the easy counter example for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, this is a counter example that lots of people have told me. Now that Sigma model didn't, the way you, the, the Sigma model doesn't arrive on your lap as a UV complete theory. Sorry, what? So we, well, maybe the right definition of quantum field theory is quantum field theory that comes with a choice of UV complete, completion. The Sigma model with non, with um, hyperbolic, like the Sigma model on a genus three curve um, isn't a priori a UV complete thing. And so to UV complete it, you could embed your curve into some say large projective space. What I think actually happens, or what I wonder if actually happens for the RG flow is not that like, uh, it starts out, I agree with you, looking like it's decompactifying the target, but maybe what's really happening is that in the, in the limit, the target is just getting like less and less real, more sort of spread out around CPM. Well, actually, I can give you other examples which are even easier than that. Start with the Lambda Ginsburg theory with some. So this is mimics the mirror of this. Cool. Then okay. there's the mirror of this story. You can start with a Lambda Ginsburg potential with sufficiently high powers, and you add the leading power, which is uh, higher or lower, I don't remember, which flows actually, which mimics this in the mirror language. So you can actually do it from the viewpoint of a compact. So it's UV complete theory. At the, at the, so there is a UV complete version of what I just said. Anyhow, okay. so that I think is, is, uh, is the answer for that is probably no. Uh, well, but, this is disappointing because it would be really nice. Yeah, I know, I know. I appreciate, I appreciate the wish. I, I'm with you on the wish, but I think that's, yeah. that's what it is. The other thing is that I wanted to say that just to uh, perhaps add uh, my own uh, uh, interest in the question you raised about favored compact TMF. So uh, that's actually very important for many other, for many, for another reason, which I want to bring out. Uh, so you, you started by describing the K theory being related to supersymmetric quantum mechanics with n equals to one supersymmetry and the TMF being the same thing for the minimal supersymmetry in 2D. Of course, you could go on to higher dimensions, uh, which, which one can. And in fact, the highest one we can go is to 6D with the minimal supersymmetry, which is 0 comma 1 supersymmetry. Now in that context, uh, it turns out that, uh, so that's also an interesting question, what is the analog of the TMF in that context and how you study those? But that actually is an interesting interplay between the zero comma one theory in the 6D with the zero comma one theory in 2D by compact finite four manifold. But that again, that typically gives you, unfortunately, non-compact versions of TMF, except uh, these theories typically have global symmetries which you can twist by and give you favored compact TMS. So, mm -hmm. so there'll be a map from uh, 0, 0,1 theories to uh, 60 to 0, 0,1 theories in 2D that uh, we described in my work with Pavel, uh, Du, and Sergey, where it connects these two theories together and it becomes urgent to try to have an understanding, a deeper understanding of favored compact TMF in 2D if you're interested in a topological, uh, topological, new topological invariance perhaps for format. So that's uh, an additional motivation to why we really want to study that. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So any other questions? I have a question. Uh, yeah, it's more like about the uh, beginning of your talk. So mathematically, one can kind of define the super well, conform field series using vertex separator algebras and their modules. So do, do people try to study topology on the space of just conformal field series using this uh, perspective? Um, this is exactly what you say is exactly correct. So I There, I mean, people have done things. Uh, there's probably a lot that I'm not aware of. Um, it, one thing that, that I've known mathematicians, that I've seen mathematicians do is you can restrict attention just to, um, so it, let me say it this way. So um, you can look at, say rational vertex algebras and study kind of 
questions about the topology of the space of ration of our of sort of ra rational DOAs. Um, and the what you would expect is you'd expect that space to be completely disconnected. And indeed it is. So so you can the you know an infinitesimal change in a in a vertex algebra is something like the, the tangent space if you have a specific algebraic object and ask what's the tangent space to the space of all algebraic objects at your specific algebraic object, that question is usually answered by some sort of Hochschild homology. And so what, what I know of is people calculating Hochschild homology of vertex algebras and measuring the sizes of tangents of these tangent spaces. And for the rational CFTs, indeed, you see that they're isolated, that they, well, in the space of rational CFTs, those are, those are isolated, which is what you'd expect. Um, now, Full CFTs, of course, we know are not isolated objects. Like people have really good understanding of what all the C equals one full CFTs are. And, and there's an interesting finite dimensional manifold of them. Like there's a sort of a line and another line that comes out and a few isolated points. Um, it's not a manifold. Other, okay, singular manifold. It's not a manifold, I agree it's not a manifold, but it, it's presumably sort of smooth after you um, put some stackiness back into it. Um, another thing that I'm aware of is that, so the I'm not aware of the vertex algebraic definition of full CFT. Vertex algebras are good enough to give a definition of rational CFT, rational full CFT. Um, but but and presumably will eventually provide a mathematical definition of full CFT. A full CFT in the rational case, a rational CFT can be modeled as a rational vertex algebra of left moving operators, a rational vertex algebra of right moving operators, and an identification of their representation categories to, to paste the left and right together. Um, presumably a definition like that will work for irrational CFTs as well in the vertex algebraic language. And it's a question of kind of doing the, the hard work of developing representation theory of vertex algebras that are irrational. And a lot of that, that works under, you know, it's, it's in progress right now by people who are not me. Um, another place where there is a definition of full CFT in the literature is, um, is from the kind of Hogg-Kastler nets of von Neumann algebras perspective which is just another way of thinking about vertex operators. And, um, and in that case, there is a, what I think is probably correct definition of full CFT, which is a, a, you know, a conformal net of von Neumann algebras with mu index one. Um, and these exist in the literature, they, because they come already from the world of von Neumann algebra, they come with a preferred topology. I don't know if that's the, the right topology, I mean, if that's the best topology, but they certainly have access to it. I don't think they've been very studied. Okay, same thing. Other questions or comments? I had maybe a vague question about this flavored compact TMF. It, could it be something like equivariant TMF with what, equivariant Euler classes inverted or something like that? I'm just trying to get more of a math description of what this looks like. I mean, so the Euler classes are, maybe these classes that vanish at uh, zero fugacity, I think, in your language. Is it just inverting those or is there something else going on with these, these poles? It could be. I don't think I know what an Euler class is. Uh, it's, a, it's like the specific Jacobi theta functions that vanish to first order at zero. So like the virus draw sigma function is one of these. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, my, my, my guess is that defining flavored compact TMF isn't too bad. Um, but is it, I, mean, I guess what I'm asking is you start with equivariant TMF, which I think we agree yeah. exists, but no one's written it down yet. And then you do something. And what is the thing that you do? Is it, do you like localize? So, so the way, yeah, so let me, so a way that I could try to do this is, so, Something that's morally true and literally false is that um, G equivariant TMF is the um, space of sections of some bundle on the stack of curves with a G bundle. 
And the reason this is false is because you have to put some, you have to like, there's some Galois, it, it, that's off by a kind of action of the Galois. Um, and um, so, so for example, U1 equivariant CMF is like the space of, of sections of some, so, so the, if you ask what's an elliptic curve with a U1 bundle, that's basically like an elliptic curve together with a point in the canonical, canonical yes, bundle. Dual, of the elliptic yeah. curve. So, um, or the dual elliptic curve. Um, and so you can sort of, sort of take the total space of, that, of the canonical bundle and, um, and ask for kind of sections over that thing. Of, of whatever the sections of whatever the thing whose sections are CMF. Um, so another thing you could do is take the space of, so what I could do is now I could remove the zero section from that canonical. What am I saying? I say there's a bundle over the moduli stack of elliptic curves, which is the bundle whose points are an elliptic curve together with a, a G gauge. Field. I could take the total space of that bundle and excise the zero section of that total of that. So now I have another total space. I can look at O derived on that and take its global sections. I see. And up to some issues of Galois theory that I, anyway, that's presumably that type of thing would give a definition of flavored compact TMF. And presumably some uh, level should be in here as well. Already for Jack variant TMF, if you take sections, it's not so interesting because everything's compact. So you want a line bundle to get interesting sections. Well, yeah, I mean, there should be like degrees and so on. Um, uh, I mean, so not degree. I mean, a level though. Something. Oh about yeah, each, a I level mean. in the in the Trin Simons case. Yes, the, yeah. the gauge anomaly should be there too. Okay, so you start with um, Jacobian TMF with some level. So I have some line yeah. bundle over my derived elliptic curve. Blah blah blah. I excise the zero section, then look at sections, and that's what you think should be roughly. That's this, right. Uh, okay. Um, so that would be a definition. Now people should go compute it. <laughs> like people should make sure it makes people should make sure it actually is well defined, and then they should just go compute it. And, and ask like, how is it, is it wacky? Is it really accessible? I mean. It's above my pay grade, but I know some people will ask about <laughs> I, I don't you. know. It could be oh, that yeah. if, like, if you ask sort of, I told you that, sorry, I, I was getting confused because there's a different thing called level structure on an elliptic curve. And I told you that if you take ZN flavored compact CMF, that's basically should be, maybe when N is prime at least, I don't know, really know numbers that aren't prime. Um, that that's, should be matching what's called TMF with level structure. And TMF with level structure is much less um, derived. It's the sort of space of, of elliptic curves with level structure is much more affluent than the space of elliptic curves. And so, the results of, yeah. and so the results of this is that, that TMF with level structure is much less hard to work with than full-fledged TMF. And maybe you should expect that's true in general for flavored compact TMF. I mean, there is a distinction between Z mod N equivariant and level. It's like Z mod N is over the modulab G bundles and level N is like at the trivial bundle, roughly speaking, I think, right? So there's, there is a distinction, maybe I've misunderstood the point, but I agree I that at some point in this moduli space of Z, on, Z mod N equivariant TMF, there's like a, a point that's, or the moduli problems representable or at whatever you yeah. want. But it's sim it simplifies a lot of the, the topological issues yeah. that you get when computing uh, these spectral sequences. But um, there's more to Z mod N equivariant TMF than just that part of the module. I exactly space. agree. And, okay. and the point is that, that I think, and I think that I'm just ag agreeing with what you've already agreed with, which is that these different things that, that restrict attention to, to loci within Z N equivariant TMF um, well, I had this like badly non-affine variety. If I restrict to an open sub-variety of it, it's more likely that the open sub-variety will be affine. Yeah, uh, that's, this fits with, with my worldview, so I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. More yes. questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I, I have one question. Theo? Yeah. Um, the partition function of a theory of the empty boardism from the empty set to the empty set, I think should be one. Um, I'm pretty sure that's true in 
Well, yeah. And no. so I'm having trouble. Sorry, the partition section of the. I'm having yes. trouble understanding how that's compatible with the, the existence of the, the zero theory. Right. So um, the zero theory is. Yeah. So so I think. Okay. I'm I'm not as I said I'm not convinced the zero theory is a theory. Um, but I did say that it should be the thing that for non-empty. I noticed that. Uh, yeah, that's why I didn't interrupt you in the talk. But um, so should have should have zero partition yeah. functions. So, yeah. Yeah. well, I do know what the zero TQFT is. That's a perfectly good, like TQFTs are things we know how to define. Zero is a perfectly good TQFT. Whether every TQFT is a QFT is debatable, but it's certainly zero is a perfectly good TQFT. It's okay, but, okay, so, but you agree yeah. that the partition function of the empty borderism from the empty set yes. to the empty one. That's right, because because what's going on is that like the partition function of the zero quantum field theory is like basically zero raised to the power of the size of the bordism that you input, and zero to the zero is yeah. one. Okay, good. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, but zero to anything else is zero. And um, another way of saying what the zero TFT is: the zero TFT is the sigma model with empty target. So if you ask for any non-empty bordism. How, what are all the maps from the non-empty bordism to the empty target? There aren't any, so that path integral is zero. If you input the zero, the empty bordism, there is a map from the empty set to the empty set. And so you, you take the path integral over that map and you get one. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions or comments, uh, let's uh, formally end the program. So I would like to thank Theo along with other speakers for their wonderful talks and the discussion. And I would like to thank all of you for 